All right. Well, good morning, everybody. This is Jomo Stewart and Mr. Roger Bergrack here for Fairbanks Economic Development Corporation. Uh, we it is Tuesday here. Let's start with that. It is Tuesday, September sixth, the day after Labor Day. I hope everybody had a great Labor Day. Uh, and our guests this morning are uh, some representatives of Ultra Safe Nuclear Corporation uh, here to discuss with the group. Uh, Small scale and micro nuclear, cutting edge nuclear technologies. Uh, as all of us are aware, this is particularly timely as the military is considering and I'm still working on the RFP to do a demonstration uh, micro nuclear installation there at Eielson Air Force Base. So it's uh, good to learn a little bit more about the technologies available. Um, uh, yeah, because we're all very excited about that. So, all right, without further ado, uh, may I please hand the floor? Thanks. All right. Well, thank you, first of all, for inviting us. Uh, my name is Chris Terabiti, and I work with uh, USNC. I'm currently the VP for business development in the US. And uh, before I forget, USNC stands for Ultra Safe Nuclear Corporation. Uh, I've been working with this company for more than a year by now. And uh, before that, I was working at one of the national labs. Uh, I'm here today with uh, my colleague, Mary Wallen. She is the director for stakeholder engagement. Uh, Mary, if you want to say a couple of things. Yeah, first of all, thank you for having us. Um, we, Christian, will we'll take a deeper dive in the technology, but I just wanted to say, you know, we, we came up to Alaska last summer and uh, went around the state It met, met um, with a, a range of different stakeholders. Um, actually, we didn't have the pleasure of meeting Jomo until uh, the middle of winter, um, but we've been you know, all around the state and really our aim was really to, to learn from Alaskans what, what the needs are um, to be able to present an overview of what our technology can do and, um, and really to work, to work with uh, uh, stakeholders there um, to move anything forward that you know is mutually beneficial in everyone's estimation. As, as Jomo was saying, um, USNC plans to uh, respond to the RFP at Eielson when that comes out. Um, but we also are, um, we have just finished a um, five month long feasibility study with Copper Valley um, Electric Association and um, during those these five months, uh, they, we've been looking at it, the technical feasibility, the the economics of of, of having a microreactor in in the uh, in, in that region of, of the state, um, likely Valdez. Um, also, we've been conducting stakeholder extensive stakeholder engagement to really learn what what it is people, um, you know, how they feel about this, what their needs are. And we've, we've, we've had the pleasure of, of really um, engaging deeply with Native Alaska communities, um, utilities, industry, um, local, lo local government, state government, legislature. Um, and the reception so far has been, um, has been very good. It's just kind of early days for all this, but more conversations like this we have, um, we learn more and hopefully we can um, also uh, share more about, you know, what, what it is we bring to the table. So to that end, um, I'll look to Christian to, to provide an overview of the technology and then we welcome, you know, all, all questions concerning the past work, with the work we've been doing in Alaska, future work we're interested in and, and anything else. And Christian, you're on mute. <laughs> okay, thank you, Mary. And now I'm trying to find, okay, share screen. And uh, all right, it should be screen three, I guess. You see the presentation? Oh, no, now you don't see it anymore. Okay, um, oh, a little bit of a challenge. Uh, can you tell me? Ask. How do I do this? Okay. Um, I'm. I tried to go to full screen. It didn't work. And uh, so, can you still hear me?
Can you see the screen now? Can you see the presentation? Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. So slide one, Ultra Safe Nuclear Corporation presentation. That's what you're seeing right now, right? Yes, sir. Yes. Okay, yes. perfect. Because I still in me that you're sharing another screen and I don't know why. And I tried to go to full screen mode and he mixed up the screens and uh, I'm sorry, but I will have to present in this way. Okay. Um, so first of all, um, Ultra Safe Nuclear Corporation. So, um, well, we've been in Alaska quite uh, uh, a lot lately. So I think that, uh, um, you know, the, the, we are building an awareness for the company, just uh, very briefly, just a reminder of who we are. So the company was founded in 2011. Uh, currently, we are more than 250 employees. So we are growing very, very fast. Uh, their quarters for the company are in uh, uh, Seattle. Uh, currently, I, I live uh, in Idaho Falls where we have an office. Uh, we have offices um, you know, through the whole US, of course, in DC, and we have um, um, a, pilot, a pilot fuel manufacturing facility in Tennessee. Uh, so several uh, locations in the US and also outside uh, with um, uh, commercial offices in Europe, uh, uh, South Africa, Australia, Korea. So it, it's a, a very well diversified and broad company. Um, so I think what makes the company special is the fuel choice that we have made. Uh, and I will talk uh, later on this, but uh, uh, just uh, to prevent a little bit the discussion, um, we have a patented technology uh, for what we call uh, FCM fuel, which stands for fully ceramic microencapsulated fuel. And uh, this is something that uh, um, it helps us to uh, make the reactor extremely safe. And uh, in, our, in our view, uh, it paves the, the, the um, it paves the, 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 the road towards uh, uh, remote operation and deployment in uh, challenging location like Alaska mining and so on, just because we can really blindly rely on the safety of this fuel and consequently of the whole reactor. Um, so what is a micro-reactor? First of all, what, well, more specifically, what is our micro-reactor technology? Uh, the MMR, micro-modular reactor, is uh, um, uh, a, a reactor um, size is about uh, 10 to, uh, sorry, 15 to 30 megawatt thermal, which would translate in, in um, electric, electrical production uh, between five and 10 megawatt electrics, um, which is uh, a fit for a lot of the application behind the fence and for a lot of the communities in Alaska. Um, what we like about this reactor is the flexibility to produce either heat or electricity, very high temperature heat. Um, and also the fact that uh, we designed the reactor using, uh, um, in conjunction with uh, uh, thermal heat storage that allow us to do a lot of load following that uh, allows for integration in a microgrid context. Because microgrid challenges is that uh, um, the load will go up and down and uh, uh, the reactor will lose capacity factor and the cost of operation will impact negatively the cost of heat or electricity with the utilization of the molten salt as a buffer, we will, we will be able to uh, uh, follow the demand fluctuation without penalizing the economics of the reactor. Um, so the, 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 the refueling cycle is also a very interesting aspect of this reactor. Uh, given the fact that uh, uh, we looked at this reactor sorry, <clears throat> as a battery, and the reason why we, we usually say that is because the core itself contains about 3 billion um, kilowatt hours of uh, uh, heat. 
And that can be used pretty much at any time. So depending what is the utilization of the reactor, the fuel cycle can be just you know, between 10 years and 40 years, the whole lifetime, depending how you use it. That is a huge advantage, especially for a remote community where the logistic of refueling could be challenging. So at that point, you will get rid completely of that. Um, so if I may, uh, yes. Christian, so, so just a, a note on format, we do encourage our members to, if they have questions or comments, to just go ahead and unmute and fire away, or I will be uh, monitoring the chat box. But if I may, just to clarify, did you say 3 billion hours of thermal storage? No, it, well, no, I was not referring to the thermal storage. I'm sorry oh. if I, I came across that way. No, the same kind of energy capacity, you said 3 billion kilowatt hours. Yes, so, yeah. so, okay. so that is the content of the fuel energy. Is the, so when, when the, fuel, the, the reactor comes, uh, it has that amount of energy in the fuel. And uh, you will need to refuel only when you run out of that energy. So the thermal storage that I was talking about with the molten salt, the capacity of that thermal storage is about, uh, uh, let me, uh, usually, you, of course, you can size whatever you like, but the current design has a capacity of uh, uh, one hour full power of the reactor. So uh, you will be looking to, um, 10, dep depending, depending uh, um, okay, let's say 30 uh, megawatt hour would be the capacity of uh, uh, the, the thermal storage. But the capacity that you have inside the core, which essentially is the one that decides how often you need to refuel, is about 3 billion kilowatt hour. That's clarifying? Yeah, that okay. covered it. Yeah, substantial. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so next, the fuel. Uh, so I said that we have our special fuel and uh, we call it um, FCM, uh, fuel ceramic microencapsulated fuel. So in this, in this picture, I don't know, can you see my, my mouse? Yes, sir. Oh, great. Okay, so what you see is a kind of blue spheres. Uh, it's a representation of triso fuel. Uh, triso is a, one of the fuel probably among the, the, the fuel form that is most used for the new advanced reactor. Um, these are very small uh, sphere. Um, you can think about poppy seeds uh, size uh, of uh, uranium uh, with, that they are, they are coated with carbon and silicon carbide. Okay, so these spheres by themselves, they are very strong uh, containers for fission products. So there is a, it's very hard to break these spheres. And uh, um, so, so they, they are very good at containing any radioactive uh, uh, fission products. Now, for, for, you know, in order to move to the next level in terms of security, what we decide to do, uh, we decide to put these spheres uh, in a shell of silicon carbide. And it's a, it's a um, it's a very interesting process. So at the beginning, all the sphere, uh, they are mixed with silicon carbide dust and they are placed inside this shell. And then there is silicon carbide vapors that wets the whole sand and the sand becomes solid. So at the end, we find ourselves with a, a small block of silicon carbide containing the triso. Um, that, you know, for, for, for uh, silicon carbide is the third most hard material known. And you can pretty much shoot on this and nothing will happen. Uh, so the, the idea is really that uh, we brought the safety to the fuel. Instead of building safety through a layer of active system, uh, we actually made sure that the no fission product can ever leave the fuel form. That is the, our approach to safety. And the temperature that this material can withstand, they are, uh, almost the double of what they currently operate at uh, in the design of the reactor. So we have very huge safety margin, which makes the, the whole reactor capacity safe because in, the, you know, in case of any possible thinkable malfunctioning, uh, the reactor will be always able to dissipate the heat outside without, uh, uh, um, without uh, 
uh, achieving temperature that would compromise this form of fuel. So release heat, not radioactivity. Yes, yes. Or radioactive material. No, no radioactive material is leaked, nothing. It's just, uh, uh, the, 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 you know, the reactor is bold enough that it's capable to dissipate the heat outside. Okay. Um, so this is kind of a graphic how, you know, a deployment would look like with two units. Uh, the two units have these two blocks down here. Uh, the molten salt tank for the hot and, so and cold molten salt are located here. And you can see the cooling system. So now, you know, one takeaway from this picture is that the, 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 the reactor is waterless. So you can actually deploy this reactor without the need of a body of water close by. Um, think, think in this way, the reactor initially was conceived for the remote mining application. Uh, which is kind of a rough environment, and you cannot really you cannot really rely rely on you know having a, a good infrastructure around you. So the reactor was thought to be kind of uh, independent, capable to you know to to operate without uh, relying on an existing infrastructure or any kind of resources from outside. Um, so just to give you a feeling, uh, this the, you know the the. The, these two squares, essentially that they, they compose the design, they're about the size of two uh, football field. And this is, will be a two units. So we are thinking, you know, we're talking about a 20 megawatt uh, deployment. So just so we're clear, the water is used for application purposes, not necessarily for cooling. Uh, there's, there's it's much in the news right now regarding that nuclear power plant in Ukraine. Yes. Uh, where part of the concern is regarding the ancillary pumps and infrastructure needed to keep the core cool. Right. I can, I can spend a couple of words. So, uh, first of all, uh, the design of this fuel was actually right after, it was uh, one of the consequences of Fukushima. In a sense that uh, our CEO uh, at the time was uh, working, I think, at Vados. Anyhow, so when, when Fukushima happened, uh, the thought was, okay, can we rethink the nuclear technology so that uh, even the unthinkable happens, the fuel do not compromise, do not pose a threat uh, to, to the you know, public. And so this is how the, the FCM was conceived. And when I said that the reactor is capable to dissipate you know, the heat uh, outside exactly what you were referring to for Ukraine, this, you know, that heat will not need any auxiliary system to keep the reactor safe because the reactor will be able to cool himself just by dissipating the heat. Um, water, where is it the water in this? Okay, so you see this white line uh, separating the two fields, let's say in this way. So uh, where you see the on the on the left, you see the nuclear island. On the right is more the conventional island. So the conventional island has the, the molten salt uh, uh, heat storage system, right? So after the, the molten salt uh, um, has a, a steam generator, uh, which is where the water enters into this system, right? So the, 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 uh, the molten salt is used to generate steam that goes through a, a classical turbine ranking cycle. Uh, the, that that uh, loop is a closed loop. So the water does not get in or out from that loop. It stays in, in, the, in the ranking cycle in the turbines, uh, also because you want to have very you know, good quality water and things like that. And then what you see here, the cooling system essentially it's just a, a system of radiator that, uh, with fan that will cool the water coming out from the turbines uh, with hair, and that's it. How, okay. If yeah. I may, uh, sorry, sorry, I don't mean to keep asking so many questions, but this yeah, is no all just fascinating. Um, so, okay, so the air-cooled condensers. Yes. About, about how much, how cool is the water going back through the cycle, uh, again, you've is it brought back down to water, liquid water temperature? Oh yes, yes, actually. Okay, so the whole system works. Um, the whole system works uh, 
uh, under pressure. Uh, sorry, so, it, so essentially it is depressurized with respect to the, the uh, with respect to the uh, atmospheric pressure. So actually, that temperature. Uh, I, I think at the bottom of the turbine you have a temperature of about 45 C, so about 100 F. And then it gets further condensed in the in the in the cool the air cool condenser. So it's pretty it's pretty yeah it is uh, I will I don't want to say that is you know um, uh, environment temperature, but it's pretty close. Okay. The only reason I ask is many many years ago here at FEDC we worked on a biomass to liquids project, okay. and we realized that in this environment what is often in the lower 48 considered to be kind of a nuisance. You've got to have a giant cooling pond to cool the water back down. In this environment, much of the year, those are very usable and valuable BTUs. Um, oh, I see. Yeah, I see come your come point. winter, 120 degree water is gold. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, we do have a question from uh, Hello? Director Florence. Yep. Hi, Christian. Hi. Um, I saw a press release in August, since we're talking about the fuel, that uh, uh, pre-production has started down in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, on the, the TRISO fuel and the, the integrated fuel cartridges. So yep. uh, any, any update on how that's going? Pretty well, in the sense that, uh, I don't know, let me say a couple of things. So, um, so the shell that you see here, actually, these are these the, the facility that produced those shells uh, already existed and is actually located in Salt Lake City. So these shells are three D printed. Uh, it's, uh, so the the, the the silicon carbide is three D printed in a porous matrix, and then they go to a bridge where they the uh, we take the uranium. And we produce the triso fuel. The triso fuel gets inside these shells with the silicon carbide dust. And then, uh, using the porosity of uh, the, the initial shell, we infiltrate with vapor. The facility is uh, fully operational. And uh, I, you know, I, I could knock at the other door and ask Mitch when, when we will see the first batch of uh, uh, the, the, the pellets coming out, but I think it's, it's uh, like in a month or so. That's great, thanks. It, it, so we hear from a lot of nuclear companies, but, um, but uh, you guys are actually doing stuff. So I think that's notable. I appreciate and I agree, yes. All right, so uh, my last slide, oh, no, last couple of slides before I give it to, to Mary, I guess. Um, so Copper Valley Electric Association, well, probably you heard about that. We have been doing some study together with them. Um, I cannot say yet anything, but uh, uh, we are going, you know, we are closing to the end of those studies. Um, we will work to prepare something that is publicly shareable. Um, you know, of course, you know, we will have to redact the document, but uh, uh, to remove a proprietary information, but we think that we'll be available also to make some uh, a public release of some of the information there. Uh, I, you know, the process is uh, what you would imagine. We are doing, you know, siting assessment, uh, technical economic analysis, uh, costing analysis, and uh, uh, that's what is going on right now. Plus, all the part about the shareholder engagement that Mary is leading, uh, which I will say that uh, so far has been very. Um, how to say, rewarding for me. I mean, it was my first time out there talking about nuclear and uh, we always got a very positive feedback. So that was, uh, um, yeah, my first experience was pretty good, I have to say. So Mary, I, I don't know if you want to take the last two slides about the project developments and uh, the stakeholder engagement. Sure. So just to follow up on what, what Lou said, I wanted to also um, just inform everyone of what um, and, and to know that this isn't a um, whether you know our work in Alaska and elsewhere this isn't a first you know that we're not looking to Alaska as the guinea pig for this project or other places we have um, 
uh, two projects that are um, going well on, you know, they're on schedule um, to be delivered in the near term, near term being 2026, 2027. Um, the first one is the Chalk River project. It's a micro reactor at Chalk River site in Canada. And that, that particular um, project is, um, it's a joint venture with Ontario Power Generation. Um, Ontario Power Generation and USNC have, have merged to have a, uh, a joint interest called Global First Power. And also the, uh, the government is part of that project in terms of the financing. So, so that's moving forward and we expect that time frame to be 2026. Um, to, to go live. Uh, also, uh, at the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign, um, building a, a research test reactor, research training reactor is actually the, the accurate terminology. That That's a, you know, up on the screen there, sort of a rendition, um, uh, roughly what that's to look like. And part of the point there is that it's, it, it's on campus. It's, you know, part of the, um, what Christian has been describing is the, the sort of the, the inherent safety features of USNC reactor and the containment area is really the the, uh, the fence line. And so this is a reactor that, um, and we're also in the licensing process, pre-licensing process with the NRC for this reactor. Um, also, I, I failed to mention up in Canada, we're in the licensing process um, uh, with the Canadian licensing authority. So. So that's part of our licensing strategy for a commercial reactor. Um, and, and both of these projects um, set us on a path for achieving that hopefully in, in a you know, closer time frame than if we were starting from scratch. Um, consequently, even though the diff there are different purposes for these different reactors, this is the same reactor, the one at Chalk River, um, University of Illinois, um, and wherever else uh, we we uh, end up installing a reactor. So um, why don't you go to the next slide? I don't know, Christian, I think you. Had. So again, I'm sort of going back to where I started it in my own introduction. Um, the work that USNC is doing in Alaska, um, really at the forefront of this has been my, myself and, and Christian. Um, having a stakeholder engagement person, you know, at the table in the beginning with kind of the business development technology side is really important. Um, kind of a, a, it's a core competency of USNC that we, we know that it's, you know, it, it, important not to, obviously to get the, the safety and the technology just right, but you need, to, you need to work with people so that people understand what this reactor is, what it isn't, how it works, what the safety systems are, how it can be utilized. And so, um, I'm really proud of the work we've done so far in Alaska because we really we've been up there countless times, um, and it really is it's not a um, it's not a chore. It really has been a pleasure meeting with so many people across the state and learning so much um, from from folks about you know what they do, how they do it, what their needs are in terms of you know energy and. Um, really, it's been almost overwhelming, too, in the sense that I was prepared for conversations where there was more opposition and pushback. In fact, people have been really excited to learn about this reactor. Uh, it, 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 as Christian spoke about, it's not just it's not a reactor that it can be used to turn the lights on in a community, but but truly the applications of this reactor, you know, for, for process heat, for industry, for a bunch of applications, um, replacing, not replacing, but, you know, enhancing other energy systems, diesel, for instance, um, and it can work complementary with, um, with other sources of energy, diesel, coal, wind, solar. We're not out to displace, but we're, the, we're, we're here to complement. Um, so I just sort of listed on this slide, um, you know, some some of the folks that we've we've talked to. Um, I won't tick them off, you know, they're there. Um, this will also be this will be listed in the feasibility study. Um, I'm proud of the fact that the the feasibility study that, as Christian said, will be made public soon. Um, will include, you know, all the different entities whom we spoke to. 
And um, so that's that's really it for now in terms of um, you know where we are with with pr primarily our work in Alaska. Um, we have a lot of other conversations we're having there now, and as as we said in the beginning with um, Ielson Air Force Base. So uh, why don't we just turn it back now, sort of pull back to the 10,000 foot, and um, Krisha and I are here to field any questions you have. All right, thank you very much. Actually, Christian, if you don't mind uh, pulling the presentation back up and maybe we can just loiter on the plant design. There was that, that high level that kind of showed the layout. I went ahead, I'm, I'm originally from Virginia and, and right across the James River from where my parents live is or live is the Surrey Nuclear Power Plant. And so I went ahead and pulled up just some quick information on that power plant, older plant. Um, and it's, I want to say it was 850 acres. So when we're talking small and micro, it really is quite a substantial size decrease on the, the necessary footprint for this, uh, for this system. Oh, Christian, uh, you'll have to unmute yourself, buddy. Yes, I agree with you. And then there's actually another piece of information that I would like to share. So the fact that uh, during the licensing process, we are going to be uh, seeking uh, uh, to have the EPZ, so the emergency planning zone, uh, at the border, uh, uh, at the fence of the plant. So you know the cost associated with maintaining an emergency planning zone, um, you know, like ten miles radius, like uh, what is currently for the the you know. For the LWRs current fleet, uh, you know that is a burden that uh, micro reactor they don't need to to carry, and so uh, for us it, it is very likely that we'll be able to obtain the EPZ being at the border, you know, the fence of the plant. So it's not only the small size, but is you know the, the small impact, and also. Uh, you know, the APZ is also a measure in terms of safety. So, you know, being capable to obtain an APZ that is a, a defense of the plant will essentially, you know, the message is there is no way in which the population may get impacted by anything happening at the plant. And I also noticed that the one that you have shown on the screen actually is a redundant system. I mean, you've got two, this is, there are two reactors on this site. Correct. Correct. And that is also part of, uh, you know, a lot of time we get the question, you know, what is the cost? What is the price? And uh, one, one of the reasons why, uh, you know, it's, it's a, a very difficult uh, uh, question to answer is because every customer has his own uh, needs and uh, purpose. So, uh, for example, some customer may prioritize uh, redundancy, reliability to the system. Some other customer may actually be more uh, in needs of uh, uh, cost reduction. So, you know, in this case is actually 215 megawatt, which uh, means that the lifetime of the core is gonna be 20 years for each unit. So this plant in this case will be able to run for 20 years without being refueled, producing 10 megawatt of electricity with two cores, which also means that if I have to do the refueling one of the two cores, I still have one of the two plants uh, working. Now, some customer, they may require also multiple train uh, in terms of turbines. Um, again, uh, the system is modular and flexible. That's the concept. And you know you will build it to to meet the customer need. Some customers, as you pointed out, they actually may look for resilience and uh, redundancy. Yeah, I spent some time over at the Interior Gas Utility and, and safety, reliability, redundancy. Those those were big discussions. Um, when people come to rely on systems, they need again, particularly in this environment, they need to be able to rely on them. Okay. All right. Again, I will. Uh, I'm. I'm. This is for you guys. Uh, so the floor is yours, members. Please, Lou. 
Uh, thanks, Jomo. So <clears throat> one of the one of the things that happened this year in Alaska is a bill was introduced into the legislature to um, set in motion a aggressive push for a renewable portfolio. Uh, I forget the exact number, but I think it was 80% by 2040. And uh, it's hard to imagine being able to do that uh, because of the intermittent nature of wind and solar. It's hard to imagine being able to do that without uh, a solid uh, base load option for power. And uh, so big hydro is, is one possibility, but another is um, nuclear. And, uh, and so we're very interested in seeing the results of this Copper Valley feasibility study uh, to see uh, kind of where things price out. Um, do you think that that study is gonna show up before the end of the year? Christian? Yes, yes. And I suppose it will be up to Copper Valley whether or not they share that broadly. Well, I think it's going to be from both sides, right? You know, there is, uh, I think I, for sure there will be a version uh, that, uh, that uh, is going to be shared publicly. Um, you know, about the pricing, if it's that is going to be in that version, I'm not sure about that. But, you know, I think that, uh, as I said, I think we should evaluate case by case. Uh, and it's not, uh, how to say, the other thing is that right now, we, you know, we are seeing also a lot of support from uh, the federal uh, with, the, you know, the Inflation Reduction Act. So I think that there are opportunities out there. Uh, to to assess other projects, and I think that uh, you know micronuclear can be competitive. Uh, also, because as you pointed out, there is the need to uh, support variable renewable, and um, you know we should not think about this reactor only as base load, given their flexibility in load following and the molten salt system. They can also be you know integrator and uh, uh, helping uh, the, the dispatchability aspect of the variable renewable. Mary, you were gonna say something, sorry. Oh, no, you covered it. Okay. Thanks. I do see that uh, Ms. Tanya Klukas has put a note ah, uh, in the chat box. So anyone who would like to see the renewables bill, please know that uh, there's a link to it right now in the chat box. We also have a question from Ms. Juliet Shepard. Can you say something about how the core waste is to be disposed of? Would USNC handle the waste management directly or would it be a third party? Okay, so first of all, um, the, the, the fueling we know is gonna happen uh, at least 10 years uh, after they, they start up or maybe even longer, it could be up to 40 years after, right? So uh, USNC is currently um, looking to establish uh, a path in this respect. And we understand definitely that uh, uh, the waste will not be, um, you know, our business case do not, I think that we are not compatible with the idea of uh, leaving the waste at the site. Uh, it may be necessary for a short period of time, uh, because we, you know, there, there is some, um, you, you would like the, the, the waste to cool down for a certain amount of time before they get, uh, trans, you know, relocated somewhere else. Uh, that will be UCNC uh, problem to relocate the waste once that, you know, they, they are, you know, manageable in terms of heat. Uh, so we think that the waste, they will stay at the site anywhere between uh, uh, six months to most one year and a half, something like that. And at that point, USNC will take care of relocating the waste, yes. So I, I also want to I also want to respond to this because, <clears throat> so I, this is where the back end of the fuel cycle, the waste, this is the work that I've been doing at stakeholder engagement for the last 20 years. So it is a big 
it, it's it's a it's a concern that we take very seriously and um, well aware of what the policy is now. Actually, the lack of um, a path forward for waste, and so you know, a couple um, to, adding to Christian's point that it would be very t short term storage at the site. The, this this fuel is not as you know hot as light water reactor fuel. It doesn't need a fuel pool. So it would be at the site for a limited time um, in in a trans uh, cast that is dual purpose, transported off the site, and then hopefully, um, you know, by the time uh, the first core is offloaded for USNC, other reactors also, whether that's 10, 20, um, that the federal government, there will be a path forward, uh, likely interim storage. Now, um, because, uh, you know, you always have to be careful that history doesn't repeat itself. It could, you know, if that isn't the case, USNC is, is actually uh, in discussions with some other entities to do its own version of temporary storage. So we're not going to cross our fingers that the federal government has solved this problem. We'll, we'll actually, uh, we have ideas of our own about how to, um, you know, temporarily deal with that until there is a federal solution to this. So, but the commitment is to not leave um, the fuel of the site, absolutely not. And um, and we'll be working with the existing, you know, regulatory structures to get, to, to transport the waste, store it, um, so that it is not a problem that the community inherits, which is what, um, you know, the issue is now with light water reactors. But it's all sitting at the site at which it was generated. Ah. Okay. Thank you. Great question. So I have a couple of just a little simple questions. I do see that uh, there in the medium left, looks like there's a person uh, for scale. Mm -hmm. What's the person power requirement to operate these kinds of systems? And what are the kind of the workforce demands, but also workforce opportunities that would come with a system like this? And would any of them be able to be filled by uh, locals or Alaskans? Okay, great questions. So uh, first of all, the, the, why I would like to give you a straight answer, the, the straight answer actually is not from USNC, but it will be from the NRC, right? So we will propose uh, uh, a staff requirement uh, that we think is, uh, you know, um, the, the, the amount needed of people for the running the plant, but then the NRC is gonna be the, the, the judge of that, right? So at this point in time, we, we cannot really share numbers because we will, you know, we don't, I, I, I really would not like to share a number and then finding out that the NRC is, uh, you know, uh, disagreeing uh, with what we think and so on. So I think that uh, uh, clearly we think that these reactors, they have a lot of capability to be uh, run autonomously and uh, um, the, the other thing is that the, the level of safety is completely different and built in a diff, with a different strategy with respect to normal light water reactors. So we expect the number of people being very low. Um, at the same time, as I said, uh, sharing a number doesn't really make, uh, you know, um, at this point in time, I would rather wait for the licensing uh, to go through uh, before we have a final number. Um, of course, uh, there is all type of jobs and uh, definitely finding in and out people seems to be uh, a little bit of a challenge. So I think that, that there will be opportunity for local uh, engagement, yes. The, the other thing, Jomo, I wanted to add to your question is, you know, so th there's the piece that Christian said, the other things in terms of, you know, jobs and um, in, employment and things that we're, we're interested in is that, Part of what the part of what this technology can be is kind of an enabler for um, a value added for for other uh, for more robust industries. So for 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 example, we were talking with some folks in the fisheries, and if they were if some industries like the fisheries were to have heat and power available that were you know was not as cost prohibitive as what they're paying now. They can keep some of the processing, um, you know, locally instead of exporting it. So it, 
it 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 can potentially enable the development of, of more business other technologies because there is um, more uh, availability of reliable heat electricity um, you know the conduit for, for doing business so think of it in terms of that too outstanding Okay. Well, Roger, your head is nodding. Yeah. What do you got for well, us? Well, very interesting. I um, enjoyed uh, seeing what they have to offer here. And, and that technology is the future. So uh, Mr. Burgraff here is a miner, and so he, he knows very well the requirements of energy and physical requirements of that industry. Um, and so much of the discussions we have up here, what, what could we do if our cost of energy was, again, a bit more reliable, a bit more available, and a bit less dear in pricing? Mm -hmm. okay. Let's see. Uh, we do have a further question, uh, although you, you may not be able to touch this one. More specifically, approximately how many specialized technology trained staff are anticipated? I guess some of what we'd always like to know up here in Fairbanks or just in Alaska generally is, um, well, yes, what kind of jobs might be available, um, but also we have a university that is very responsive um, to the needs of industry. And so, you know, this would kind of give us, uh, this might be a, a, something else for which the university might set up a, a training curriculum so that we can begin to provide the kinds of people you all need uh, moving into the future. I agree with what you said. And one thing that I want to point out is that, you know, I think that Alaska does not represent an opportunity for one reactor or two micro reactor. Alaska represents an opportunity for multiple reactors, multiple, you know, more, you know, in, in the in the tens, right? You know, more than, you know, like probably 20, 30 micro, if not even more than that. So I think that uh, it, it's uh, it, uh, it could be a job class in some sense, right? By the way, everybody's frozen on my side, so can you still hear me? Yes, sir, we hear you. Can you hear us? Yes, but everything is frozen, so all right. <laughs> okay. We see you. You're moving around. <laughs> good, good, good. Well, also, I can see on the, uh, again, the, the non-nuclear side of the business, there's a lot of things that are, are you know, maybe, maybe kind of standard to the industry, steam generator, right. uh, air condensing, Again, kind of things that are they're already uh, already being peopled in our, our utilities. You know, really in terms of uh, how many jobs these represent, I think that uh, we have to think about how many sites uh, we're going to have in Alaska because you know it's more like um, so. Um, we have seen precedent like New Scale, and uh, you know this is maybe uh, uh, the trend where the industry is going that crew will be able to supervise multiple units, right? But I think we have to think about in terms of size. And I, I see in the opportunity for, you know, a very large numbers of sites in, in Alaska. I, mean, I would think, you know, 20, if not more. So, um, uh, you know, at that point, really, it could be, it could be a, you know, a new type of uh, work uh, created in Alaska and the university can play a big role in that. Yeah, certainly with our just enormous size and vast distances. Uh, Correct. Yeah. Correct. By the way, I mean, even 20 years ago, I, I was uh, allowed to have a tour up at Prudhoe Bay. And I was surprised at just how few people were necessary to run some of those major uh, pieces of infrastructure uh, with all the automation. Uh, that was uh, built into those systems. Mm -hmm. So it's okay. I mean, we're not trying to make you promise to, to have a thousand jobs per site. Just trying to get a feel. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, right. I think it, uh, Lou, Lou knows well that, you know, if I have uh, 10 megawatts with thousand people, it is hard to get people <laughs> electricity, right? All right. Well, everybody, we are nearing the top of the hour. Uh, but we still have a few minutes, so I would open up the floor. Um, please feel free. You don't have to uh, put it in the chat box. You don't even have to raise your hand. If anyone would have any questions, please just feel free to unmute yourself and fire away. All right. Oh, oh. no takers. Okay. 
All right. Well, Mr. Rabini, Ms. Woolen, thank you so much for the presentation. We really, really appreciate it. And again, this is exciting. Um, thank you. We've been talking about this for a long time. We have a lot of friends. Uh, Gwen Holdman comes to mind, uh, who've been monitoring this evolution uh, quite closely over the years. And so it's neat to see that uh, we, we, again, may very soon be the, uh, a demonstration site for this cutting edge technology. And we need to see what, what broader use we might be able to make of it. All right. Well, well everybody, if there's no further questions, I'll go ahead and turn you loose. Again, I hope everybody had a, a great Labor Day weekend. Uh, Snowpocalypse ate my shed last winter, so I finally got it moved out yesterday. Um, so we're, we're almost in time for the next snowpocalypse. Um, Hello. Yeah, so we do have another presentation. I believe we have another presentation scheduled for next week. Let me just verify that. I believe we do. Either way, just know that I'm always working to find stuff. If you have anything that, uh, that you have interest in that you'd like me to try to run down for a presentation, please just let me know. Uh, beyond that, again, Mary, Christian, thank you so much. And everybody, just have a great rest of your week. Pleasure. Thank you. Uh, make sure uh, we look forward to seeing you guys on your next trip up here to Fairbanks. We will. All right.